What's up, everybody? Oh, what's going on, everybody? Sorry about that. Having a little technical difficulties here. Judson's camera looks like it. Uh, let's see what it's doing. Let's see what it's doing. What's going on? What's going on? I don't know where it went. Let's see. I'm going to figure it out, though. So, Judson, you just talked to the people. I think our stuff is frozen. All right, guys. Hang here. on with us for a second. We're having a little technical difficulties right as we switched over to live. But thanks for tuning in tonight. We're super, super stoked about the show. Talking about surf fishing in North Carolina. we got an awesome guest, Ryan White. Um, we're just really stoked. This is our fourth show. We've been working really hard to bring you all some, some cool stuff. And hopefully you are learning as much as we are through this. Um, just a little reminder that just go ahead and share this broadcast on your Facebook or on your Instagram page. Uh, we'd like, like as many people as possible to see it. And as we're um, going throughout the show, if you have any questions, feel free to comment. Ask those questions here live and we'll get to as many of those as we can answer. Uh, we think that's just a really important part of the show is being able to communicate with people viewing and, and, uh, and answer y'all's questions. So if you do comment at the end, we're going to pick a lucky winner to win this, uh, cool painting of a pompano that a local North Carolina artist being my mother, who, who really believes in our show did. So this is a pretty cool little pompano painting and you could win that tonight. If you comment, we will, uh, we'll pick, pick one lucky winner. So Sweet, man. take Sounds it away, good. Billy. What you got? Absolutely, man. Well, I think I got all the technical difficulties figured out. Nothing is easy in life. This thing keeps uh, telling me that it hates me. So working out. Hey, look at us. There we go. We We got it. I promise it's not because I don't know how to work the software this week. It's just like uh, we're having some internet quality issues or whatever. Hey, you're doing great. We're we're, we're streaming uh, Ryan White in from from the outer banks uh so that's pretty awesome but well man before we get into it i think you kind of hit all the stuff up front about the winners and all that kind of stuff um so comment like share we're gonna be doing all that kind of stuff so dude i know i saw you out fishing this week uh judson and really just kind of give us a rundown of the fishing report i saw you guys just slaying redfish like from your instagram and your youtube channel and all that stuff so tell us a little bit more about that all those posts are from about a month ago i save them oh. for when i when i hit a really slow <laughs> week i'll start throwing stuff up there and so people believe that I'm still catching fish. No, it's been a pretty good week. Um, I've had a lot of, a lot of uh, family bait fishing trips and stuff like that, and we've been doing real good on the redfish, on some docks along the waterway, as well as some of the creeks that I like to fish. And um, Spanish mackerel have finally been close to the beach. We've been catching them in the inlets and uh, casting to them, which is a lot of fun. I like to cast uh, if I if I don't have to troll. It's it's I, I really prefer the casting method. But yeah, I went offshore last week. We we did pretty good. We found some mahi and um, oh, dude, which good. is delicious, by the way. Thank you. Did you eat it? Mahi. Did you eat the mahi? Uh, uh, yeah. So we we're trying some of it. My wife is not her favorite, yeah. but it's good. It's not her it's not good. her favorite. I understand. She says it's a little too fishy, but you know whatever. But fishy. but we had that red drum and that flounder that you gave us. So for we sure, I would have thought you would have liked the, the mahi a little bit better. But yeah, so the offshore That's fishing good. was good for us. It, it was it was a little slower than than uh, the guy I went with had, had done last the week before. But guys are really tearing up the blackfin tuna out of Wilmington, and and the mahi fishing still pretty good, coming in closer to twenty and thirty miles. Um, and the the speckled trout fishing has continued to be really great. And um, yeah, it's it's been good. It's been really good. Lots of bait showing up, and and I feel feel like things are kind of kind of leveling out. And caught some nice flounder this week too. So. It's been uh, it's been a good week. It's been a good week. That's awesome, man. Well, dude, I, yeah, like I said, I saw you guys slaying the red drum. Um, and if, for some of you who don't know, Judson is a, a captain here in Wilmington. So if you want to go out and catch some red drum, catch some Spanish, do whatever. I think he's busy this week though with Fourth of July week. <laughs> it's it's a pretty busy week. Yeah. Yeah, man. Everybody's so pretty, pretty. Everybody. Busy. This is like the season, so. So that's awesome, man. We'll do. Let's get into our sponsor shout outs really quick. And yeah, then, for sure. And then we'll get to um, uh, my favorite part, the C- the CETO safety tip. We'll get to that as well. But so just a shout out to a couple of our sponsors. Uh, we're going to be uh, giving away an AFCO hat today. Or wait, is that right? AFCO? Is yep, that the hat AFCO. Away? Awesome. Yep. So we're going to be giving away one of those to the catch of the week. Um, and then, so we want to thank those guys. There you go. There's that AFCO hat. Boom. Uh, and then Eastern Angley, as I was telling you, Judson Brock sitting here in front of me, um, is the sponsor of the show as well. Thorpe Creative is my business. We do t-shirts, hats, just built Judson an online store. An awesome online which store. Which will be, uh, launching pretty soon if you haven't already. Um, and then the CETO safety tip of the week. Let's go ahead and get into this. This is, uh, this is from the Wilmington or Wrightsville Beach location. Designate a sober skipper for the July 4th weekend. 
<laughs> I like it. Dude, I, like it. I love these tips of the week because they're like so practical. Like in, A in sober the, skipper, is that like someone skipping down the road? It's or? a sober skipper, man. Yeah. As long as they can skip, I don't know. <laughs> I, I have no idea. So anyway, um, cool, man. So what, who, now who is the catch of the week again? Let me go ahead and bring that up right here. The catch of the week was His drum roll. John Hawthorne. John, look at that. What is that anyway? Is that a tuna? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that is a tarpon he caught just uh, just off the beach right down there at Oak Island. Oh, right off the beach at Oak Island. All right, man. Well, yeah, that's Oak pretty Island's interesting. Yeah, Oak Island's a secret spot. Oh, okay, a little secret spot. We can't talk about that anymore. So, All right, cool, John. Well, let us know where you're from, watching from, like wherever you live, and we'll send you um, this painting, right? No, not the painting, the hat. No, the hat. The hat. We'll we be sending you the hat. Cool, man. So awesome, dude. Awesome show. I'm super, super excited. Juts and I have been working pretty hard on this show, um, as we do every week, just to bring the best people, really, for the topic we're you know, talking about. And so when we decided we want to do surf fishing, the first person that popped in my mind was Ryan White out of the Outer Banks, owns Hatter's Jack. Um, you know, owns Hatter's Jack, is a partner with Advanced Fishing USA, and then also is a rep for century rods and so he builds rods fly rods surf rods like we'll get into some of that in the show but literally one of the fishiest and funniest dudes i've met i know you just met him i met him 15 minutes ago and i was like hey billy let's jump in the truck tomorrow and go so let's jump in the truck and go fish outer banks so anyway guys i will i think we covered everything even though we had a little technical difficulty so we're gonna go ahead and bring on our on our guest ryan white from hatteras jack and let's go ahead and bring on multicam here what's up ryan how you doing man Hey, hey guys, how's it going? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on tonight. Doing well, dude. Thanks for being being here and trusting us. I always tell people when they come on, thanks for trusting us with your reputation. Uh, <laughs> and and tr- you know, we've only this is our fourth show, so you're helping us pioneer this well, thing. See, so we appreciate it. Yeah, it seems like you guys got it together pretty good, man. Uh, I like it. Yeah, man. So hopefully, you know, a little rough start, but hey, we're going to make it. So, dude, first of all, one of the fishiest dudes I know, I I met Ryan. I worked at a different job, so I'd always go in there um, when I was making deliveries and try to sell Ryan some advertising, some sponsorships, things, things like that. So you've always been a huge supporter of the community of fishing and dude, that just awesome. But literally, and I'm not saying this just because you're a guest, like one of the fishiest guys I know, I, I know you fish in in north carolina so you fish in the states you fish alaska i saw on your instagram you fish down in mexico which is i'm gonna admit that's where that spanish came from that we promoted you with <laughs> <laughs> judson looked at that thing yeah, was they like, got some was like, spanish down there man is they, they they call them sierras down there but they're spanish mackerel. yeah that thing was a monster yeah man that so that awesome. thing yeah. that thing was a monster so anyway dude welcome to the show and we're gonna go ahead and get into it i'm gonna let judson uh, just start hammering you with questions and anything you want to share, or if you need to grab something, he's at his tackle shop there at Hatter's Jack, owner of Hatter's Jack in his tackle shop. So if you need to grab something, feel free to do that. So I'm going to let, let's go ahead and get started, Judson. Yeah, for sure. So I want to just start out with like some warm up questions, uh, kind of get to know you a little bit, but first off, we're talking about surf fishing. Do you have a favorite fish to target in the surf? Man, as of right now, it's got to be uh, it's got to be rooster fish out of Mexico. That's that's my that's my big thing, and it's been my big thing for I don't know, probably going on ten years. Um, topwater rooster fish in Mexico has got to be probably the most exhilarating uh, surf fishing experience I've ever had. Um, they're they're an incredible fish. Uh, you know, when they're in, it's like fishing in an aquarium. You know, there's a some techniques we use are you're pulling the bait through the face of the wave and it's just like the rooster fish just jumps out of the wave like an aquarium and uh it's it's really it's it's something else but um one of the next things uh there's two more things i really feel like i need to do one of them's giant trevally from the surf oh yeah and oh, the other goodness, one is, yeah. uh, land land-based tuna that's that's another one that's so those are those where are do you do the buddies. land-based oh. tuna um, Ascension Island, they got some spots in Australia, uh-huh. uh, Hawaii. Um, so there's, there's some different spots and, uh, that, that goes for uh, giant trevally also. Yeah. That's awesome. Dude, that's super and cool. I'm thinking, right. Those are the ones that bust out of the water and eat the birds. Is that right? The trevally. Yeah. Yeah. Trevally. Yeah. 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 My father-in-law yeah, has been talking about that for like once a fly fish for those things. I'm like, I don't know if I even want to get near one. Yeah. <laughs> you got to put yeah. the wood to those things I've got, quick. I've got some buddies that go to the Seychelles and do that. And that's, uh, that's definitely on the list also, man. I've gotten into fly fish in the past few years. So, 
you know, uh, the, it's just kind of added a new depth to the surf fishing thing, you know, and For even sure. boat fishing, you know, the fly, the fly, the fly game's a whole other, whole other animal. Yeah, dude, we'll have to do a, a special fly show with you. Sometime, yeah, for sure. I know you guys sure. will really hit it off, and and I like. Uh, I'm a I'm a hack when it comes to fly fishing, man. <laughs> That's the best. That's the best. You get too persnickety, and then it's 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 all over. So, all right, if you're gonna be if you're gonna surf fish in North County in the Outer Banks, what good question? What is your favorite fish to target there? Because of course, yeah, our favorite gonna... fish is going to be the trevally and the tuna, but. Yeah, so I I'd have to say you know I I love red drum fishing uh in the surf i love uh, fishing for speckled trout in the surf um i love uh i love um spanish mackerel you know the 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 sierra thing you know i love i love the high speed thing but you know the trout's the trout's a challenge um drum are just big and yeah. um you know man the, the the days of the big blue fish there's there's nothing better than big blue fish on top water around here you know that's a that's a just a joy for anybody yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, what is uh, what would you say the most epic day you've had there in the Outer Banks surf fishing is? Oh God, the most epic day. I don't know. We we do a like I fish a lot of tournaments, so mm-hmm. you know there's different different ways of epic. You know, there's the the tournament fishing epic where you know it, it doesn't matter what it is, you're just catching as many as you can possibly have, getting to the beach as fast as you can, getting back out and getting another one. Um, so you know. Uh, We've had several tournaments. Uh, we we did uh, the Anglers Club tournament, the Cape Hatteras Anglers Club tournament. We won that two two years in a row. Uh, I mean, that's a that's a lifetime achievement right there. You know, getting getting something. You know, having that on your uh, on your resume. That's that's pretty incredible. And I'm gonna have to say those are probably those winning those two tournaments would probably be the most epic days of uh, of surf fishing I've had on the on the Outer Banks as far as excitement, but. You know, there's uh, there's always the days before and after the tournament where the fish, you know, the the real quality fish really chew. Right, right. And, uh, can never be tournament. You know, there right. was there was one day I can think of that we were leaving for the Ochre Coke tournament, and uh, we um, we decided the ferry line was so long we just decided to say screw it. We're not going to try to not going to try to you know beat our way through the ferry line. We're just going to go over here and fish uh, right next to the ferry. So we went over the dune. And we wound up just blistering the big drum on the uh, while we were waiting for the ferry to leave Ochre Coke. So <laughs> that's that was awesome. uh, that's that's definitely one of my one of my favorite stories to tell. Yeah, that's super cool. That's super cool. So we're gonna kind of jump into you know some informational parts of this show, kind of asking some questions: the how, the what, the where, the when kind of questions. So. Um, sure. Yeah, for sure. You want to? You want to? You got a couple for him, Billy? Yeah, man. I'll just start out and just so our viewers know, and then also our listeners. So we, you know, I don't want to take up too much time, but we did launch our podcast this week. Uh, that was one thing we we're going to mention in the front end, and oh, yeah, totally yeah. forgot. Uh, so that's on our website, so you can do that. Uh, we're on Stitcher, and we are um, on TuneIn Radio officially. We're on Google Play Music officially, and we're still waiting on Spotify. And um, what's the other big one? Oh yeah, iTunes. We're waiting on the, <laughs> the the biggest one out there. We're waiting on those guys. So so we're trying to keep in mind as we are talking. We have listeners as well um, as as we're talking. And then also, if anyone in the comments or in, that's watching live, uh, feel free to leave any questions as we go, and I'll try to keep up with those. And Judson has his phone as well, and we'll try to keep up with those. Um, so, dude, first question for you, Ryan. Uh, this is you know for someone who doesn't surf fish a ton. Um, how do you decide where you're going to make your first cast? Like when you walk onto the beach, what are you looking for there? Um, so before you make your first cast, the thing you need to do before you even go to the beach is you need to check the tide. Okay. Um, you know, every, you know, when one thing you got to remember about, uh, about fish is fish, regardless whether in freshwater, whether they're in saltwater, You know, they hang out around structure, they hang out around currents, they hang out around water temperature changes. So you got to kind of play the same thing on the beach side. But the first thing you need to do is you need to check the tide and make sure the tide is moving. You know, whether it's in or out, um, it uh, kind of depends on the style of beach you're fishing. Um, So the first thing you need to do is check your tide. the, the uh, The old adage is two to three hours either side of the high tide. You know, you want that tide moving in or you want it moving out. And there's some, you know, there are some times when you fish, uh, you know, closer to the lower tides for trout and flounder and things when the, 
when the uh, tidal pools get pinched off and the uh, the, the tides running in a narrow uh, narrow channel. Um, but that's the first thing. You check your tide. You want to make sure you have moving tide. Um, another good pregame gig is checking Google Earth or Bing Maps or whatever your favorite uh, satellite imagery is. And you look around the beach. Um, one of the things to look for is uh, an outer sandbar. Um, and the structure on the outside that, you know, can, and it, you know, it could be on the inside or the outside really, but, uh, check in Google earth. Uh, you're looking for breaks in the outside bar. You're looking for points, uh, that protrude off of the beach, um, all that stuff. So there you can kind of get a preliminary of the area you're going to fish. You find those, you go ahead and make a scouting trip, you know, go out there, look and see what you got to work with. And, uh, you know, you, uh, you need to kind of plan around the, uh, around the, uh, the structure. So if you're looking out there and you got a, a good, um, good, uh, outside bar, you know, you can fish both incoming and, and outgoing tides, depending on which side of the bar you're fishing, uh, which species you're fishing for. Um, but, uh, once you get all that dialed in, and you wind up on the beach, standing down at the beach. Uh, one of the easiest things to do is finding a spot where you have a little bit of uh, heavier shell gravel, um, looking for a spot where the waves will come up onto the beach. So you get your waves that wash up onto the shore. And if you look down the shoreline, you'll see little valleys where these waves kind of funnel back out. And typically at the bottom side of them, there's a, uh, there's a muddy like boil where the water's churning up. Uh, around those little muddy boils, you know, regardless of whether it's a, a high impact or a low impact beach, fishing those muddy boils right up close on an outgoing tide is a, is a winner. Most, uh, most times, you know, you can catch anything from a, a whiting to a pompano to, uh, you know, I've, I pulled big drum out of these little, you know, low impact flat beaches and you just see this little muddy boil kind of pouring out into the water and here comes a 40 incher, you know, it's, uh, oh, wow. that's awesome. there's, there's just, there's little things like that. You look for like dead sand flea hulls laying on the surf. You know, that's a good indicator that, uh, sea mullet and pompano have been in feeding. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, those are some good, uh, initial things to look for. So w one thing that, that I feel like people ask a lot is like, all right, I'm like, I think about some of the beaches around here, like Fort Fisher and Carolina beach, and people are like, oh, my beach doesn't have any sandbars. Like, where do I go fish? I can't find any, like, outside sandbars. I can't find any of the stuff, like, that I that most people talk about. Is there something else that they can look for to, to target? Yeah, well, that, that was what I was touching on there towards the last part of it. The, bo um, the boils and, washing you know, out off the beach? Yeah, when, you, when you're down in, like, uh, Carolina Beach, Fort Fisher, there's not a lot of outside structure at all. Um, so, and what you have down there in, in Southern North Carolina is called, uh, what we refer to as a low impact beach. So it's a, it's a flat beach, um, somewhat structureless, if you will. So that's, that's when you get out there, that's when you look for the muddy boils. And the reason I say you want to hit those on an outgoing tide is all your sand fleas, your clams, your shrimp, your crabs, all that stuff is buried down deep when the tide is out. So when you get the tide coming up, everything else comes to the top along with the tide. So if you're fishing an incoming tide, everything really hasn't brought, made its way up to the top. But when you fish an outgoing tide, everything is at the top and it's working its way back down and it's out, it's doing its feeding. Uh, so when you're fishing, you know, Carolina Beach, uh, you know, Curry, all that area down there, it's uh, it's a uh, you're going to be a lot better off fishing the little muddy boils right at your feet, and uh, um, you know going going about it that way on an outgoing tide. Right on, right on, and that that's cool that you're saying you know pompano, whiting, redfish, everything coming out of those those same little zones. So, um, all right, so we'll kind of jump into the, the kind of the casting, the presentation, everything like that. Billy, do you have a any, anything you want to want to go with 
Yeah. As far as those questions go? Yeah, man. First of all, I just was like, um, I forgot what we were doing the show because I'm like, man, this is such good information. I it thought is. I was just like watching someone's video. I know. I want to pull like, a notepad out. Like we had like 10 questions. You answered them all for that seg- <laughs> that session. So uh, this might be a pretty quick show just because you're like so valuable of information. So, dude, as far as casting, you know, I think a lot of times in surf fishing, like I know when I go surf fishing, like I get this big old surf rod. I got all this weight on it. I got all this meat on the other end of it. And, dude, I mean, I take take that thing and try to fling it out there toward like the shrimp boaters or whatever. Like I'm trying to get it way out there, but dude, from what you're telling me, it doesn't see, I mean, you're saying like, Hey, fish at your feet. That doesn't seem that far away. Man, can you talk about that as far as like casting distance, like presentation right, a little bit? So in, unless you know what you're looking for in the, uh, like if you're, if you're looking out in the ocean and you're like, Oh man, I see that sandbar right there. The tide's coming in. It's putting a little eddy right off the edge of that sandbar. You know, there's a nice drop off. I see a transition between uh, deep and shallow water, and I want to hit that spot. That's when that's when long distance comes into play. Um, but if that's not a if, if it's not applicable at the time that you're fishing, or if it's not uh, within your ability, then fishing at your feet is going to be a much much better uh, much better option. Um, you know, there are some, uh, uh, I guess what you would call exceptions to the rule, uh, doing stuff like Spanish mackerel and things like that, where you're, you're trying to cover area and, you know, that's when you're doing little guys like this, like, uh, like spoons, you're, uh, you're casting and retrieving, you're just covering area, you know, you're as far out as you can go and back in and as far out as you can go in a fan cast. So there's, there's area covering, but, you know, strategic, like, like your chess game stuff. Uh, that's, you know, the fishing at your feet, fishing the edges of sandbars, uh, fishing, uh, you know, everybody tells you not to swim in a riptide. You know, you see all the signs, don't swim here, don't swim here, you know, riptide, danger. Don't swim there, fish there. Fish there that's, in the riptide. You know, you got to fish there and on the edges of the riptide, you know. Um, great places to shark fish if you're into land-based shark fishing. Um, you know, riptides carry a scent of a bait out, you know, chum bags if you're uh, oh, yeah. cobia fishing from the beach. You know, if you're looking for some place to put a big bait or a chum bag, a uh, riptide's a great place to do it. Okay, yeah, man, that sounds that that's like some really good information as far as like you said, keeping current up and looking for those those moving waters and things like that. I'm yeah. just gonna jump. Uh, we have people Ryan that are, are commenting, and so here's a question that just came in from Mo Yarbro Barrow Burrow. I'm gonna probably just massacre that person's name, but it says, "Have you guys used Spro Bucktails with Gulp three inch green mullet on a high low rig for surf flounder?" He's saying that he's torn them up at Indian um, Beach. Is that something that you're familiar with? That you've man, uh, I'm sure you're familiar, but high you low rig, I'm I'm sure it uh, it would work fine. Um, gulp on a on a bucktail is a uh, is a you know it's a that's a classic flounder bait. You know, um, as far as uh, as far as colors, you know, colors vary from day to day. Um, I'm not a I'm typically not a fan of a high low rig per se. Um, I'm a bit more of a fan of a of a tandem rig where you have a, a bigger bucktail in the front or a bigger soft plastic in the front and then a smaller one trailing behind. Um, let's see here. What do I have on my rack? Oh, uh, no. Um, so this is, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this. This is one that we've, we've taken. Uh, somebody has stolen one of, the, uh, one of the baits off of. But we've got a lead here that runs up to your, uh, uh, let's see here. Let me get this in front of the camera. So this would be your, uh, your soft plastic and your lead head. And you would have one trailing off of one side, which would be down here in a smaller one. And then you would have this with a swivel on it going to your top line or to go into your running line. So that's a that's a favorite trick. Um, then that is a that's a classic flounder play, you know, is a, a bait following another bait. Um, as far as colors go, white and chartreuse are probably the best ones you can find for flounder. Um, you know, unless you're dealing with uh, with like really dark water or low light conditions, then, then, you know, then you go back to the, well, the, uh, the dark color for dark water kind of, uh, scenario. Okay. Awesome. Here's another question. Let me just bring it up real quick. I'm going to, I'm going to add it to the broadcast. Let's see if we can get it big on here. Oh yeah. Hey, look at that. How about that? Okay. So what's your basic setup for surf fishing? Looking good there, Billy. I like that. Yeah, man. Check that Uh, out. It looks nice. Yeah. That's, that's techie as I have seen in a while. (laughs) This is nerdy. Uh, That's what I do. But, uh, and it even moves. <laughs> um, 
But uh, basic surf fishing setup. It's um the basic thing. So we got two of them that we that are probably the most popular. Let me try and untangle this off the wall here so I can present it. All right. So you got two different ones. Number one is your double bottom rig. So what you got is you have a swivel on the top. Let's see if I can get that in front of the camera. Maybe, maybe so the you other can way. See it. It, uh, everything's backwards. All right, so <laughs> you got a, <laughs> you got a swivel at the top right there. That's your swivel. You got a sinker at the other end. Let's see if I can get the. Yep, there we are. There's your sinker. So swivel and sinker, and in between, you have two hooks. There we are. Two hooks. Um, this one happens to have floats on it. Uh, they don't necessarily need floats. But that is the the age old basic surf fishing rig is a double drop bottom rig. So you got two hooks on there and uh, one high, one low. Sometimes you'll put teasers on them. Here's another one. This is one of my favorite ones for tournament fishing. So this one I have a Sputnik sinker on. And I've got a clip on there. This is tied out of 50 pound fluorocarbon. You got your bottom hook and that's bare. I got pieces of tape on there so I don't stab somebody or myself. Um, and then you got your top hook with a teaser. So this is one of my favorite tournament rigs that we use. Um, the bottom hook you use for, you know, sea mullet and pompano and uh, puppy drum. And then you got your top hook with a teaser on it. This gets up here and dances. I mean, we've caught Spanish mackerel on these. But this is traditionally, you know, bluefish and trout. Okay. So, um, you know, those are those are two basic rigs and um another one i guess i should touch on uh, if you give me one second here to fetch it uh would be what we call a drum rig or a fish finder rig uh a chunk rig um and these are the basic things man there's all sorts of deviations on this there's a cannonball rig and there's clip down rigs like they use in europe and uh so anyway but this is a sinker slide right here you've got a small collar that your line runs through your sinker goes on that let's see i think i gotta get used to this camera oh yeah there <laughs> your you sinker go. goes on that this is a frog tongue sinker this is uh real popular it's got good hydrodynamics uh as opposed to like a four-sided pyramid so it lays flat in the water good for uptide fishing which is fishing into the current um and then the other thing you get is you get a uh this is a leader with a hook on a short leader which is you know kind of hatteras style this is about two and a half three inches long but these two work in conjunction together so this works like an egg sinker it's essentially a big carolina rig so you got your sinker and your sinker slide this goes back and forth up and down your line it pegs down when you cast lays down on the bottom the fish can run with this and not feel the tension of the line on it it also gives you the ability to drift your bait away from your sinker or uh, move it down current from where you're fishing. Um, so the, the chunk rig, that's popular for, you know, people who make wire ones for sharks, drum, cobia, uh, tarpon, any, you know, any big game. Um, the smaller, the double hook rigs, those are traditionally pompano, sea mullet, Kroger, uh, puppy drum. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Right on. Over, the overview of the, the the favorite, you know, two basic styles of rigs that work the best. So talking about rigs, is, is there a specific hook that you're always going to fish? Do you like J-hooks or circle hooks, or is it changing depending upon what I you're am, doing? I am a, you know, if you're, you know, bluefish a lot of the time, it's a whole lot easier to fish um, J-hooks because, you know, they're so erratic and spastic that it's, you know, almost easier to snag them in the side of the face other than uh, – <laughs> actually hook them in the mouth sometimes but um i am a huge fan of circle hooks and i'm going to say probably 95 percent of the uh of the fishing that i do is with circle hooks um and it's an acquired taste um some guys still fish the jays but you know um especially uh doing I'm, I'm big into catch and release you know i'll keep a few few fish here and there but um, you know, big drum fishing, definitely, I, I try to do as little damage to the fish as possible. And uh, I'm also, uh, I prefer using smaller circle hooks to larger circle hooks. Uh, with the circle hooks, you know, most of the time you're going to peg them in the corner of the mouth. 
And, um, you know, as long as you're not using too big a bait to where it gets in the way of the circle hook, they, they work phenomenal. Awesome. 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 Uh, we going back on a question we had on here, they're saying when you're targeting flounder from the surf, what are you looking for? I know you've hit on like the different tactics, but is there anything specific, real specific to like, if you're going out there wanting to catch flounder? All right. So flounder one Oh one is go to the inlet. Go to the inlet. Um, go to your inlets, man. Find some structure and fish the fish the leeward sides of the structure. Uh, you know, so if you got jetties, rocks, the closer you get into the rocks, the more flounder you're probably going to catch. The more lures and terminal tackle you're going to lose, but um, <laughs> that's uh, that's just part of the fun, right? It keeps me in business. Ah. For sure, for sure. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, um, flounder 101s go to the inlet. Um, the other thing you want to do is fishing the tidal pools on the beach. And uh, a lot of the time, you'll find that uh, when the tide, when the tide is uh, just finishing up or just uh, just taking off, you're going to find that the uh, the the um, I guess you would call it the channels or the troughs between the tidal pools. So uh, actually, I guess I could probably do a. I love diagrams. That's why I got this pen right here. <laughs> hey man, we love diagrams. We do too. I'm just going to do a little a little diagram. Visual here. learners. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And if you want to, when so, you explain it, uh, just keep in mind we will have some podcast listeners. So if you want to try to yeah, explain yeah, it so to those guys, what uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm trying to find a marker that actually works here. Ah, there we are. So I'm going to have one side that's going to be O and one side that's going to be B. So that's uh, we'll just call that ocean and beach. So um, this is just going to be a crude drawing. Um, but it, it, it is, uh, it is kind of a, uh, kind of the way things tend to happen. All right. So what I have here, uh, I'm going to try to get this. So it shows up. All right. So this would be your beach side right here. This would be your ocean side. And what you wind up with is you wind up with the tide flowing through these little channels right here along the beach. So these would be like flounder 101. When the tide, sl you know, when the tide goes down, those uh, those channels there have a tendency to pinch off, and everything that's in that slough that's trying to feed is going to move in and lay in front of those uh, in front of those spots. And you know, trout work the same way. Um, they work just like a brook trout. Essentially, they lay there and wait for dinner to come to them. Um, they're not super active feeders like bluefish or Spanish mackerel or even drum are. They're you know they're more of a I'm going to sit here and wait for dinner kind of guy. You know, they're ambush predators. So um, they're they're waiting for things to come to them. So what you'll wind up doing is, you know, fishing fishing these. I'll pull this back up. Um, but what you can do, let's see here. I got to go the right way. Uh, this guy right here, um, where you come through, this part right here, where the water pinches through. Um, what you wind up doing is you wind up throwing out those those outer blobs that I drew there, sandbars. So what you're doing is you're actually casting out onto the top of those and letting, you know, all you're doing is keeping your, keeping your line tight and just kind of dancing it and letting it fall off into the trough. And, uh, um, that's, that's, uh, you know, a lot of people try to run it too fast. If you think you're running it too slow, slow it down a little bit, so slow, slow presentation for both trout and flounder. Um, but, uh, fishing tidal pools is another thing. And then when you're down Carolina beach, Wrightsville beach, Go back to those uh, those muddy boils. They'll find flounder hanging out right in front of those. Um, same thing, man. Every everything you know, fish or fish, regardless of where they're at, they're going to hang out around structure, and they're going to expend as little energy as possible to get food. Right on. Well, let, let's. Uh, that, let's did that cover it? Yeah, that covered. It. Yeah, that's man. Right. So so you're telling me to when I go to the beach on the weekends. I look for low when when it's low tide. I look for where the little kids are playing. No, go to high high. No, high tide. I'm saying on a low tide, oh, okay. when the kids are playing in those pools, I go fish there later on high tide. Is that right? Exactly. Well, <laughs> when the tide starts moving, not necessarily oh, high okay. tide. You wait till the top high, and the things are going to be all spread out again. They're going to be like all over the place. Oh, sure. But gotcha, you're, what gotcha. you're looking for that, that lower tide, you're looking for the congregation of the fish to uh, to kind of tighten up. Yeah, man. That's awesome, dude. That, that's a lot of great information right there. Just kind of a personal question here. How how how's y'all's trout fishing in the surf throughout the summer? Is that more of a fall winter thing, or can you go? Uh, it, it's more of a fall and uh, spring thing, oh. you know. Um, the northern beaches up in Nags Head and uh, Kitty Hawk and up there, they have a pretty decent uh, speckled trout bite in the um, 
in the you know spring or uh, early summer. Um, down here we see a few here and there, but our our trout season down here is um, October and November. Right you know, right right now the trout are biting in the Pamlico Sound. The trout fishing down here has been absolutely phenomenal uh, sound this year. I mean, there's uh, absolute gag of fish, you know, and there's a few really nice ones mixed in, you know, some some citations, a lot of uh, a lot of 20 inch fish. So, you know, great for the frying pan if you're uh, if you're into that. Oh, sir. So we're going to jump into kind of just debating, not debating, but talking about artificial live bait. Is are you when you go out there, are you like, oh, I just want to fish artificials if I can, or I just want to fish live bait, or are you completely situation? Uh, I'm I'm at the point right now where if I can fish artificial, I'm going to fish artificial. That's that's really um, I've kind of uh, kind of fashioned myself here as of lately, being you know uh, more into the artificial game. You know I've caught been fishing my whole life with uh, with natural bait and live baits, and you know I'm looking for something that kind of brings a bit more of a challenge into it. You know, as you'll say, you know fish don't eat wood, fish don't eat plastic. You know, it takes a little bit more to get them to hit that than what it takes them to hit a hit a chunk of bait on the bottom, or a, or a live bait. Well, but let me back up from that. If I'm tournament fishing and I need to catch fish, I go to live bait, or or natural bait. Right on, right on. Hey, uh, is your mic plugged in real quick? I'm just getting a couple. Uh... Check it. Oh yeah, here we go. I is it in now? Uh, Did I knock it loose? Can I you hear think me? That was it. Yeah. Let us know, guys. I got a couple. Sorry about that. Got a couple of technical issues. Got a text and a couple messages said they couldn't hear Judson. Uh, so you're answering some awesome questions, but they didn't know what they were. <laughs> hey, the they answer to the question is, is like all Jeopardy, we need. Man. Yeah, it's like Jeopardy. <laughs> yeah, they can figure it out. <laughs> so do you have trout? <laughs> do you have like a go-to artificial that you, that you like to throw as far as as fishing in the surf goes? Kind of a catch-all yeah, artificial. Probably. Probably my favorite is um, soft plastics for the for here on the Outer Banks, you know, North Carolina. Um, soft plastics such as, uh, you know, I like the, uh, I think if I want to be correct, this is the, uh, I think that's the uh, Silver Mullet Bass Assassin. Oh, yeah. Definitely. That's a trout slayer right there. Yeah, dude. That um, early season, I like the, the, the like, um, Oh, uh, I guess if you would call it a Christmas tree color or Festivus, if you're talking about Z-Man or the opening night, those are really good. Uh, early season in the ocean or um, the, uh, you know, of course, flounder, chartreuse and white are your two go tos. Um, but uh, but that that that. So the the silver mullet bass assassin, uh, the smelt gulp, uh, bad shad, Z-Man, all those colors that. You know, darker kind of a. Uh, you know, let's see here, kind of a. Uh, let me get it in front of the camera. There you go. That's too big. All right, there you go. You know, dark back, light belly. Looks like a mullet. Looks like mud minnow. Looks like a, whatever. You know, just uh, it's it mimics just about anything you want. A glass minnow, but it's just it's a good all around bait. It's got the it's got the the flash in it for the for the sunlight. It's got dark back for the dark water. It's just a, a great any anything along those lines is going to be really good in the surf. Um, it, as far as the big bull redfish, the big old drum in the in the fall in the sorry, I'm stumbling upon my words here. But as far as the big bull redfish, what do you like to throw for those same same stuff? If you're throwing artificials, you well, up a little bit. The 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 big drum, you know, the the game down here on the outer banks has always been uh, always been um, fight chunks, your, you know, fight your neighbor on big eight. Eight and bait, eight and bait, eight and bait, which is, you know, that's the traditional way that it's been done down here, yeah. and it works phenomenal. But uh, if you're into the lure fishing thing and you want to do some of that, there are some great opportunities for that on some of the less fish beaches. Like, you know, Cape Point, don't bother trying to take an artificial down there because you will do nothing but make friends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't, don't do that. You know, that's that that would not that would not go. That would go like over like a, like a lead balloon. But – you know, things like the uh, north and south side of Oregon Inlets where you're fishing, um, you get some good outflux. Um, Hatteras Inlet's a good spot for it. Any inlet, you know, whether you go down to um, whether you go down to Corebanks and you're fishing Ophelia or if you're fishing uh, anything like that, you can you can get some great use. 
out of darters. And uh, what you're doing with these guys is you're finding uh, structure outside the mouth of the inlet and uh, casting and floating these out to the leading edge of the structure. And these swim in the current. You see they got kind of a beveled head on them there. So these guys dive in the current like this and swim. So what you do is you feed it out to the edges of the sandbars, you know, crank it in until you feel it start to dig into the water and you sweep it across the face of the sandbar. Um, great, great tool. When there's guys that fish these stuff like this, um, they fish this for striped bass, they fish it for tarpon. Um, it's just a great all around, uh, great all around lure. And you follow this just like you'd follow uh, color wise on lures, you know, um, you know, light, 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 you know, clear water, bright days go with the lighter color, dark water, darker days, um, go with, uh, go with the darker color, uh, nighttime. A lot of the times a darker color is going to work well. Um, the other thing you can do is, uh, SP minnows are really good. These cast well, even though they're a lipped crankbait and, uh, these cast a lot better than the darter does. So, you know, you essentially work these like you work any, uh, any lip lure. It's a cast out, crank, pause, crank, pause, or twitch, pause, or uh, let the current sweep it. Um, some of the other things you can do, um, this is a spool tech. This is one of Patrick Seville's deals. Uh, but these big soft plastics are really good. And this one's kind of cool. I like these because the hook breaks out of them. So the, uh, you know, the, the fish has no leverage against your, uh, against your lure. So you wind up holding a lot of fish. And if you do wind up getting a toothy critter, you got a wire leader in it. So it's a great, great soft plastic for bigger fish. That's super cool. I just had a question come in while you're explaining that that says, uh, is there a certain, you know, weight jig head that you prefer to fish? Uh, in the as circle? light as you can get away with. As light as you can get away with and have contact with the bottom? Yeah, the light, the light, the, the, the name of the game, just like bass fishing or anything else, it's keeping the, keeping the bait in the strike zone. And the slower that bait falls, the better, the better, uh, the better off you are. The longer you can keep that bait in the middle or in the water column you're trying to fish, the better you are, better off you are. Right the on. more natural presentation, the better off you are. And the, the lighter you can get away with, that typically produces that. We just you know, unless you're looking for super distance, you know, like where you have a uh, where you have a sandbar you're trying to reach. And, you know, then I'm going to steal a steal a line from uh, my buddy Nick Meyer. Um, and that's going to be it's better to put the wrong bait in the right place rather than the right bait in the wrong place so you know if you need to get to where you're where the structure is you know you're better off using a heavier head and getting your getting to where the fish are more so than worrying about the presentation as much when you can't reach them right on right on i like that i feel like that's been a trend that question gets asked a lot uh, in a bunch of yeah. fishing scenarios and people are always saying you know as light as you can fish but still have good connection with what you're fishing uh, i feel like it's yeah. so much more natural that way too uh, personal question. Yeah, you know, sorry, what were you saying? I was going to say loop knots too. That's a big thing I really like. Is you know a, a loop knot or like a like a, a um, terminal clip or something like that, where it gives the gives the bait a really nice natural fall and it gives it a lot more action than actually tying like a, let's say a fisherman's knot to the to the loop on the bait. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, so next next thing we're going to kind of jump into, and guys, if you have any more questions as far as what to look for on the beach and kind of what, what to fish, please fire them off and, and we'll, we'll come back and answer those. But we're going to kind of jump into the rod and reel segment of this. I, I always get a lot of questions from, from clients and I don't, I don't do much surf fishing, but you know, can I take my, my normal fly rod or my normal spinning rod out and, and fish in the surf? And I feel like in a lot of applications, yes, but, but Ryan, uh, as, as, uh, Billy was telling me, builds a lot of rods and is really in tune with, with different rods yeah. for different scenarios in the surf fishing game. So, um, do you have any questions, Billy, about the about the rod building and and the you know the different rods you're using, different yeah, settings? Yeah, well, I mean, I've kind of been lucky enough to be in Ryan's shop a few times and get to see his whole build out set up and uh, kind of in process rods, and then I actually got to fish several fly rods. By the way, thanks, Ryan, for letting me uh, send those down and let me fish them and show them off, and and, and my father in law took them and showed them off in, into the you know freshwater arena over in Tennessee. So. Those century rods, man, they're they're next to none. They're like they're pretty solid and 
and I know, I know that one time, dude, we were at that fishing school, or no, fishing show, I saw you at a fishing show, and you're out in the wind, it's blowing 20 miles an hour with a four-weight fly rod, and you're slinging like <laughs> 50 yards a line, like I was casting with no, no wind and like a 10-weight or something crazy, like it was pretty <laughs> solid. <laughs> so dude, tell us a little bit about those century rods, man. If you have one there, feel free to show it to us. Here's your time uh-huh. to promote a little if you want. All right on. So yeah, we, we, um, so I guess jumping back into it, the surf fishing thing, um, with the fly rod is, uh, the, the main thing you're battling a lot of the times here, particularly on, uh, on the, you know, Hatteras Island, Ocracoke is you're battling the wind. So is, uh, that's going to be your biggest thing, um, is trying to fight the wind in these scenarios. So, um, yeah, you can bring your, your fly rod, but you know, is if you're trying to do anything with anything less than about a, um, in a single hand, less than about a nine weight, you're going to be uh, kind of getting your butt handed to you. Um, as far as uh, as far as like strictly surf fishing uh, on the on the surf, we've actually uh, done a couple of uh, we got a couple of actually right here in the store. I've got a couple of prototype fly rods. Um, this is a this is kind of a it's a single hand rod primarily, but has the ability to switch. We did a little little elongated butt on it and did a little elongated foregrip. This is actually a grip that I came up with. That's um, awesome. That's this is a this is a, a ten foot fly rod. Um, and uh, it's kind of a it's this is our mid flex. It takes about a four hundred and fifty grain line to load it well. Um, and that's so uh, for you guys that really don't know much about fly, it's about a twelve weight line. Um, most of the time we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be doing um, you know, an intermediate or a sinking line. Um, I've done some stuff, uh, you know, top water occasionally, but most of the time you're trying to cut the waves. Um, I've even played around, uh, some stuff that I've taken to Mexico and played with. Um, this is a, uh, this is a diver head that I use a lot. Um, both, let's see if I can get it onto the camera here. Maybe. Oh, by the way, there you go. There we are. Yeah, so this is a diver head that I use a lot of. Um, see if I can't get it. But it's a foam diver head, and uh, I use this a lot with an intermediate line. And I've got that, and then I've got a leader tied to it, and then I typically put like a small clouser or small deceiver in front of it so you get the bait chasing effect when you're pulling it through yeah. the water. And the diver head works a lot like a crankbait coming through the water. It's really, really cool, really cool kit. Um but uh, that's that's been something I've used in Mexico. Um, here in the uh, here on the Outer Banks, uh, pompano, whiting are a lot of fun to catch on the surf. And I'm looking for a. This is kind of a small um, a small crab pattern. It's pretty popular. Uh, this one's blue and white. And you say that's but, for uh, for pompano and whiting? Is that pompano? Pompano, whiting, puppy drum, trout will hit it, but it's a, it's essentially kind of supposed to mimic, I guess, a sand flea kind of thing or a minnow kind of thing, but uh, it works really well, man. I've got quite a few on those guys, and uh, you know, like I was saying, a lot of the times you wind up throwing a, throwing a big surf, you know, a big heavy line and everything. It's not necessarily because the fish are that big that you're going to catch. It's because the conditions warrant it. For sure. Uh, as far as, you know, your, your spinning rod setup, what's your go-to rod and reel if you're going to be throwing the spinning rod in the surf? Um, if I'm going through a spinning rod, so it's kind of funny you ask that. Um, the past couple of years in tournaments, uh, I really haven't even broken out. Uh, you know, I fish a lot of the beach tournaments, as I was talking about earlier. I The past uh, last year, I didn't even break out a bait casting rod during the tournament. Um, I have been fishing um, a lot of, you know, of course, I'm fishing century rods. But um, the the Surf Machine Elite has been a real popular one with us, which is one of our new uh, nano cilia resin and graphene uh, combined rods that are just really next level as far as weight, durability, um, accuracy, distance. Um, and I've also been throwing some like 15 feet, you know, 15 footers and things like that, all with spinning reels and a braided line. Um, this. Uh, any of the reels that are like this guy right here, this is a Shimano Altegra. This is one of the reels. This is actually one of mine that I use. Uh, it has a long cast spool on it. So uh, you see it's got uh, a real tall spool, and it's also very wide. 
And the, uh, the theory behind that is the flare coming off of the spool. When you have a deep spool, so something like, let's say, an old SS pen that has a deep spool to it, you get a lot of line flare coming off of the reel. So in turn, you get a lot of extra friction. Um, same thing with monofilament. You know, using monofilament on a spinning reel is uh, it's what, to, what you would refer to as a heavy body line. So it's got a lot of friction. So um, spinning rods, um, braided line, uh, mainly 40-pound test and below. Um, like some of our surf machine rods that we have um, are actually uh, soft in the midsection to uh, – absorb shock so you can run it without a shock leader so you're able to fish 20 pound 10 pound well not 10 but 20 pound uh 25 pound leader and uh, still fish five six seven ounces and eight ounces and not have to worry about blowing your leaders apart while you're doing it um and then of course i've got the uh some of the big sticks like the uh let's see here if i can reach one of these guys not trying to belly dance for y'all or maybe i am <laughs> i'll put the tip jar out yeah i was gonna say what's your paypal we'll put that on the screen and people uh, can tip uh, you there exactly huh? yeah <laughs> uh, now I'm, but uh i don't know this this is one of the big sticks uh, it's 15 feet long so and i've got it hung up in the buzz baits on the wall 15 uh, feet man that's uh, insane yeah so that's that's this guy right here, and this is one of the Eliminator series. Um, this is, let's see if I can get the. <laughs> that's what that, that, that's when you <laughs> take to the. You're the little shop. Yeah, that's the so one you take guy, to the truck I've dealership. Actually, um, <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I've actually I've done this one so I can use a bait casting and spinning. So this is a 30 millimeter uh, low frame K guide. Um, so. Uh, but this is one of our uh, one of our Eliminator series. This is the T700. It's 15 feet long. It's really good up to about eight ounces and a chunk of bait. Um, it's one of our graphene reinforced models. And you know, if you don't know anything about graphene, it's like a new super material. It's uh, you know, uh, 200 times stronger than steel, harder than diamond, and has elastic properties. So it's just amazing stuff when it comes to composites. What you can do with oh, it, wow. and uh, the benefits in torsional properties the benefits in recovery uh the benefits in durability are are pretty impressive dude so but, what's uh, the this, what's the distance on that thing man what what have you thrown that you know it, of course conditions warranting <laughs> but you know on a on a really good day you know 100 and 170 to 200 <laughs> yards with small baits um you know six seven eight ounces six and seven ounces seems to be the best overall for distance um, you know, but fishing small, uh, small hooks and small baits, you can, you can really, uh, you can really ramp up some distance, man. It's impressive what they can do. And, uh, you know, the, the braided line on a spinning reel is actually the, the great equalizer between, you know, bait casting or conventional reels and spinning tackle. Um, you know, you start putting a braided line on, on spinning rods and you're, uh, you're right there with the best of them as far as the bait casters, you know, you don't have to worry about, uh, breaking control of the spool, um, you know, the, the braided line gives you a, a real, uh, real low body line. So it's minimalizes the friction of a spinning reel. So, uh, yeah, there's a, there's, there's a lot of things you can do with, with modern equipment, you know, and, uh, most of the time you can, uh, you can address it with the same techniques that you're used to, but, uh, sometimes you do need to make a couple of adjustments to your, to your techniques to make sure that things work the way they're supposed to. And when you're talking about techniques, like, are you talking about casting techniques? Are you talking about, can you d dive a little bit into that for just a minute? Uh, so techniques, when I'm, when I'm talking about it would be, uh, you know, casting techniques, you know, you, when you're dealing with braided line, you know, smooth is, is, uh, is really a big thing. Um, when you're, uh, casting techniques, man, that's a, that's a whole nother show <laughs> right there. <myself. laughs> so, um, Casting techniques, uh, man, the, <clears throat> there, I guess what I can touch on on that is there's one basic technique that follows all good casting, and that's your, uh, your left, using your left arm, punch-pull. Okay. You know, so many people talk about punch-pull, but um, the, the punch is more, more of like a thrust, more so than like an actually 
back here to up here. It's more you've got your arm slightly bent, and it's more of a more of a thrusting with your uh, you know straightening your elbow out. The majority of your power is going to be in your pull, and uh, okay. you know it's um. And that's loading that. I, I guess while you're saying that, I kind of think of fly fishing. So I'm really I'm letting the lot the rod load up and really launch that. I'm not exactly. trying. To, I'm not trying to run it. I mean, because dude, I mean, I'm out there on the surf sometimes, dude, and I'm like, I'm trying to get some distance or whatever. And I'm look like a fool. I'm like running as hard as I can, <laughs> and like kind of. Yeah, I should be on a YouTube video. Cause I'm, and I'm like, and then it still doesn't even go that far. And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> Take a thirty yard running start to get to the surf before you make your throw, and, and it trip, goes trip and up. eat it. Yeah, dude. People are com- <laughs> people are confused. Or they're like, are you surf fishing or pole vaulting? We're pretty confused right now. <laughs> Would you say a good bit of yeah. it comes into having that bigger, beefier, longer rod as well? I mean, that's, you know, there's there's a point of diminishing return for everything. So, True. you know, you definitely have to take into account the person's physical abilities, uh, physical abilities as much as uh, as um, the the conditions that you're fishing. So, you know, whether you're fishing, a, you know, if you're trying to get distance and you got a big headwind, you don't want to put your put your your bait and weight way up in the air and try to get a big arc on it like you would if you were a. Uh, uh, with a tailwind, you know, you try to throw a flatter cast and sidearm. Um, but, uh, but you know, uh, a, a good overhand cast with a softer rod, just a straight overhand punch pull, will get you, you know, good distance, fishable distance. Okay. You know, yeah, that's cool. Then when you're talking about, you know, the guys that are going down to Cape Point and things like that, and, you know, fishing the outside bars. Um, tournament guys, that's that's when you start talking about, you know, well, we're going to take it to the next level. We're going to learn how to swing the swing the weight and the bait out around behind us and uh, find your perfect pickup point where the uh, where your weight and bait become weightless in the transitional area before it's when it stops going away from you and starts coming back to you. So there's I mean, you can get as geeky with it. <laughs> that's awesome. I just I just want to know what kind of. Oh, I think your audio dropped out. What was that? I said, fish at your feet, kids. Fish at your feet. Fish, fish at, your, at feet. your feet. I just want to know what <laughs> I was asking earlier. Like, when I go to the truck dealership, I guess that's how you buy a truck when you are a surf fisherman. You just take your rod with you and go, hey, which truck will this fit on? I'll take it. <laughs> uh, is this fit bed? Nope. Oh, yep, next truck. Next truck. <laughs> need a big old truck. That's awesome. Um, so you were, you were touching on, on the bait, the bait casting reels, as well as the spinning reels. Is there kind of like a a old timers frown upon guys throwing spinning rods in the surf or is it kind of, you know, Um, teaches us? It depends. Yeah. There's kind of a stigmata about throwing, uh, throwing spinning rods in the surf, uh, at least on, uh, on the outer bank, you know, you go anywhere else in the country, everybody and their brother's got a spinning rod and you didn't see a conventional anywhere. Um, but, uh, but man, I mean, conventionals you know they they you, you can ultimately get better distance out of a conventional um if you know what you're doing for sure um you can uh you know the conventionals are smoother on the on the cast you know you don't have to worry about ripping the end of your finger off uh you get a lot more torque out of it um the conventionals tip it you know don't fight fish quite as nicely with the with the rod being as you get the torsional load on it so the rod wants to roll on you right um but you know it's uh and i mean conventional is uh is the old is the old way and it's you know considered here on the outer banks to be the the proper way you know it's the it's just kind of the way everybody does it so it's um it's just accepted here on the outer banks and that's just kind of how it's done yeah man that's all well and dude and really for a, a surf fishing destination i think we can all agree that the outer banks is like I mean, I don't know what it is on national lists, but from everybody I see on Facebook and as we're doing research for these shows, it's like, dude, that's like one of the go-to destination places to to surf fish in the States for sure. Well, so. pretty much on the East Coast, you got Sebastian in Florida. Um, you've got uh, Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, Montauk, New York, and you've got Cape Cod Canal. And those are like the going up the East Coast. That's pretty much your four biggest surf fishing destinations. You know, Jacksonville's got a pretty good surf uh, surf crowd, and you get down uh, Jacksonville, Florida, that is, and uh, you get down towards um, towards like Jupiter Inlet and stuff like that. There's some there's a bit of a surf fishing crowd down there too, but they're mainly chasing tarpon and jacks and sharks. 
<laughs> okay, cool, man. Well, so in a little bit, when we were talking about those rods, you kind of alluded to conditions and you know weather conditions and things like that. Um, just kind of hearing this last little bit of the show, uh, you know, what are people looking for, especially if they're beginners, like as far as weather, like, does that play a big part in like, should I go? Should I not go? Should I always just go and hope for the best? What's your well, take on that? You know, typically here, when you're talking about Hatteras Island, a light onshore wind is going to be your best, your most favorable wind for the surf fishing conditions. Um, light onshore wind, you know, decent weather, you know, you get, if it's blowing too hard, of course, it's not going to be good if it's blowing, you know, a nice calm day is always preferable. Um, you can check your salooner tables if you're into that. Um, I think they, uh, they, you know, there's, there, it, it does. I'm, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Um, you know, your moon, your moon phases, things like that, you know, around a full moon, around a new moon. Those are always good to do. Um, you know, definitely check your tides and make sure that your tides are proper for the time that you're getting ready to go. Um, those are, those are all things that I would take into consideration, you know, and of course, stay away from the, uh, stay away from the beaches during holidays, of course. Okay, cool. Well, I, I wanna, so you struck a, you struck something, uh, Brian just commented and he said, uh, he was in Sebastian Inlet today. What pointers do you have concerning ta- uh, tarpon in that area? Man, I've fished there a couple of times. Unfortunately, I've never landed a tarpon down there, caught a tarpon down there. Um, but what uh, most of the time down there, from the times I've been down, you know, you're looking for uh, for an outgoing tide. Um, a lot of guys fish the jetties down there, and um, you know, um, I fished uh, the times I fished down there. I fished with Alberto Knee, um, tactical angler. I got one of his uh, one of his little plugs right here. Uh, a tremendous fisherman, but, uh, he makes a, uh, he makes a darter and he fishes down there almost all the time. Um, but he fishes, uh, fishes around the jetties and, uh, you're looking for, um, for an outgoing tide, um, just, uh, just about the time when the, when the waves really start jacking up out there, uh, has been the, uh, the, the game plan for the tarpon and you work your, uh, work your plugs down the face of the, uh, work your plugs down the face of the, uh, shoals that are outside the inlet. So it's a uh, middle of the outgoing tide when things really start getting churning, running your darters out, fishing them across the front of the bar. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's the tarpon game down there. There's some, um, if you're, um, if you're lucky enough to, uh, to run into them, um, there's, you know, there's some really good fishermen down there that do, uh, that do the Jacksonville thing or, uh, Jacksonville, sorry, Sebastian Inlet thing. Um, you know, some of the guys, Alberto, of course, is one of them. Uh, Mike Bass Knight's down there. Um, uh, Jay Clark fishes over there quite a bit. He's uh, he's one of my pro staffers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's that's the technique down there. And, of course, you know, your your moons, your, uh, your new moon, of course, your full moon, secondary. Um, you know, you want to find those big tides, those, those uh, wide, wide, uh, the, the broad tides, you know, we have the big tidal swings. Those are the real good times to hit that area. All right. Cool. Right on. Well, what do you, what do you think about, uh, or as far as surf conditions and, you know, like real swelly, nasty beach days or, or calmer days, is there, um, something that, that you'd, or, or either one of those that you'd rather fish on, on the outer banks? Um, I mean, you know, as far as it goes, drum conditions are typically, you know, a northeast wind, choppy, chunked up water. Like, uh, the, you know, you go out to the pier and it's it's chunky and, you know, big fat waves and snotty and it takes 10 ounces to hold. You know, that's that's the old proverb. Oh, yep. Good drum water. Good drum water. Um, you know, they drum drum and whiting, uh, croaker. Um puffer fish you know sweet toads those really don't seem to mind the the dirty water too much you know those guys will feed in dirty water they'll feed in you know clean water it really doesn't matter but when you wind up with things like spanish mackerel that are uh that are a sight feeder um you know tarpon um pompano all those guys really seem to do a whole lot better in in clean clear water Right on, right on. And my other question kind of played into that as well is, and, and we touched on this earlier, but the steep sloping beaches versus gradual beaches. Um, is, All right, so that's – oh, go ahead, sorry. No, you're good, you're good. That was it. 
Um, that that's the difference. That's what we call you get your steep beach. That's what we call our high impact beach. High impact. OK. And okay. that's typically, um, you know, you got some you, those, those beaches typically have a little bit more structure to them. Um, and, uh, you know, your your high impact stuff, you know, you have a you have a good good opportunity to fish incoming and outgoing tide. Whereas with your uh, your flat beaches, it's mainly uh, mainly an outgoing tide bite or an outgoing tide fishing time. Um, you know, there's just not much point in fishing a fishing a what we call a low impact beach or a flat beach when it's uh, when it's low tide or incoming tide. Right on, right on. Well, my last question for you is: if someone were to come up to the Outer Banks tomorrow, come see you at your shop, and they they hadn't done much surf fishing and they wanted to uh, to get out in the water and, and maybe just bend a rod on something, what would how, what would you set them up with? What's going on right now out there? All right, so right now we've got a, the sea mullet and pompano bite has been really good this year. I mean, really good. We've had a lot of big sea mullet and a lot of big pompano. Um, so I would probably start out, um, you know, somebody who would be a newbie, I would say, you know, man, let's get you set up with some uh, sand fleas, some shrimp, some blood worms, and uh, we're going to get you out there. We're going to fish you close in um, and, uh, you know, get your outgoing tide, you know, find your muddy spots in the water. Uh, that's, that's kind of the direction I would steer them in. If they got a little bit more, um, little, uh, maybe not quite green, but got a little bit of experience. I'd probably, we've had a really, really good Spanish mackerel bite from the surf also, and also off the piers. So I would, uh, I would push them towards some sting silvers, um, ES lures, uh, shore lures, something along these lines. And I would send them out early morning and late evening. Uh, particularly, let's see here. Um, so tomorrow, uh, high tide's going to be around 8 o'clock. So if you were trying to hit the bluefish or the Spanish mackerel tomorrow, I would say uh, try to get out there early in the morning, providing this uh, southwest wind that kicked up tonight doesn't uh, doesn't muddy the situation up too much. Um, we've had uh, we've had some problems this summer where the uh, the southwest wind's blowing really hard for a couple of days straight, and it causes an upwelling. So what it does is it uh, it pushes the um, the top layer of warm water off and pushes it offshore and allows the the cold uh, undercurrents you know the the Labrador current water you know muddy cold you know 55 to 60 degree water come up close to the shore and that pretty much shuts everything down except small croaker small mullet and skates and dog sharks so. Um, that's what I would suggest them doing. Also, you know, we've had some really good fishing, fishing from the shore on the sound up here this summer. Um, been some really great uh, trout bites from guys that are waiting uh, in between Salvo and uh, Red Anthe. So, I, you know, if things are, uh, things are looking a little funky, I'd say, you know, hey, uh, try the sound side. Uh, particularly uh, like we got tonight with the southwest wind pumping up. Uh, there's uh, some really good drum fishing on the sound side of the, uh, of the islands here. Uh, on these southwest winds uh, between Avon and Salvo. Yeah, man, you're telling me that the uh, that trout fishing was really good on that sound side. So, and I guess when people think of of the Outer Banks and they think of Hatteras in that area, they always think of surf side. But really, you guys got a really good yeah. sound side fishery as well. Yeah, so. is, as long as we don't have a cold winter, if we get a winter when things freeze over and we have a trout kill, it shuts us down for a year or two. But um, like this winter, we had a couple of mild. Or last winter was really mild. Um, and you know, the flounder fishing has been really good in the backwater. Um, been some good flounder gigging back there. Um, the, uh, the trout fishing has been phenomenal and, uh, the red fishing has been all, you know, the, the drum have been good too. Okay. Um, drum of, you know, more, more closer to the shore. Uh, trout have been more into the grass beds. Man, Ryan, that is so, so much good information in this show. I see we, we have people, um, you know, commenting like, man, great show, great show, great information. And dude, you made our jobs easy. Judson and I are sitting here looking, at, <laughs> we're sitting here looking at each other like, uh, man, he has crushed all of our tricky questions we we're going to ask you. Um, so man, I would love to hear, you know, we're coming up right over an hour. It's our goal the whole time that we've had this show is to be at an hour. So we're, we're over, we're an hour and eight minutes right now. So we're doing pretty good. Um, but dude, would love some takeaways from you, some closing thoughts. Um, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a surf fisherman, 
fishermen, either either new, beginner. You know, I think there's a lot of beginner surf fisher, fishermen and, and anglers on here that are saying, hey, this is such good information. I wanted to try surf fishing, but, you know, never did because I just didn't know what I was doing. Um, and probably a lot of guys like me out there pole vaulting <laughs> besides surf fishing. So, <laughs> so, dude, any takeaways or anything for us or for our audience just, that you have? Just start out small. Start out, you know, with smaller rods, start out fishing in close and just work your way into it. I mean, you know, just like any fishing, you know, 90% of it's being there. You know, if you if you can get the time and get out there, get out there, start start experimenting, you know. I mean, I can give you some some good uh, good pointers and things like that, but nothing nothing beats experience. So, you know, my my big thing to tell everybody out there, if you want to go fishing, go fishing. Don't sit around and don't you know, get get a basic idea. Don't spend too much time on the internet. There's a lot of weirdos out there. You know, <laughs> definitely don't give them your phone number and don't give them your address. Because weird. <laughs> Dude, um, that's... Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> <laughs> that was my next question, man. You stopped me before I got started. Yeah, but, you know, just get out there, man. Get out there. Go fishing. Um, you know, if you don't want to spend the money on it, go get yourself a cheap bottom rig. At, you know go out, dig yourself up some sand fleas, you know, get a little bit of shrimp, you know, whatever, just get out there, fish in close, try it out, see if it's your gig, you know, and uh, the, I'll, I'll tell you, man, even when you don't fish, just the being out there, the, the, you know, being able to watch the water and watch the waves has, it's a, has a very therapeutic effect, you know, you know, just get out there, get in the quiet and just get in your zone and enjoy yourself, man. That's what it's all about anyway. Yeah, man, absolutely. Well, I think that's what, you know, this show is about, trying to educate people, one, how to do it, how to how to take that first step. Because, you know, like you said, the idea of going fishing is nice, but the action of going fishing is, like, much better and much more rewarding. So, uh, man, if, unless Judson has any more questions or if anybody online that's watching has any more questions, now's your time. Uh, we're going to go ahead and give away the uh, picture that your mother – and is that a painting, Judson? Is it's that a what painting, that is? yeah. I'm, I'm going to bring Judson up in, in just a second. It's a painting, yeah, man, it's beautiful, isn't it? She's talented. People, y'all need to keep tuning in because she's done a bunch. Yeah, we're gonna give several oh, of these wow, away. Look yeah, man. look at that. She just phenomenal artist. Uh, so wow. We, right? we, yeah, we're gonna be giving some of these away over the next several weeks. Um, so her name is Judy Brock. So check check her out. Uh, and I guess we'll just go ahead and randomly select. Do you have the comments up? You want to select who we got going on yeah, over I'm gonna, there? I'm gonna do a little scroll and stop with my finger. We'll see who gets it. Awesome. Here we go. Nope. All the comments aren't loading. You might have to do it on your. Oh, okay. Here we go. I'm gonna, <laughs> there was, here we there go. was three that loaded. I'm gonna, I, dude. We had this random picker, but it never works. So I'm just gonna randomly pick. Oh. Let's see who is it. Three, who is it? Two, oh, here we go. One. Cliff Nagel, uh, watching from Merle's Inlet, South Carolina. So Cliff, you are going to get a picture painted by Judy Brock. Uh, so just make sure if you're still watching that you uh, send us your information, your details, your shipping details, and we'll get that right out to you. Man, what a great what a great episode. Once again, guys, thank you so much, Ryan, for uh, coming on the show. I knew you were like the surfiest, fishiest dude ever. Surfiest. Surfiest. <laughs> uh, you do surf- I, like, I like that word. Fishing is guyest Everest. You're the surf fishingest guyest I've ever seen. And dude, that guy, <laughs> so what's the, what's the longest distance you've ever casted now that we've got through all the business let's ask a fun question <laughs> do you do any surf co- do you have- i think if, if i'm not mistaken my best is like 778 feet in the casting tournaments and that was that was back when i was into it that's but yeah awesome, i never man. i never broke the 800 mark but you know i was i was close yeah, that's awesome, that's man. Impressive. I guess you got to have a really good. We didn't talk about this, but you probably have to have a pretty good set of gloves for that, or you just put some duct tape on it. No, or? It's, it's not so much gloves. It's uh, you know, most of the guys put a little little thumb thingy on there, a little piece of inner tube or something on their gotcha. thumb. But uh, the main thing is, man, is just it's technique. It's just like a golf swing or anything else, man. You know, you don't have to be the biggest, baddest mofro on the block. You know, you just uh, you just got to be smooth. You got to have good technique. You got to know when to apply the power that you have. And, uh, you know, um, the guys that are the guys that are the 900 foot casters and things like that, they have uh, they have the technique and they have the brawn, too. So, yeah, but, you know, to be, competitive, you know, um, you know, you don't have to be a, you don't have to be Andre the Giant or anything. You don't have to be Danny Moskops. Um, but, yeah, man, there's there's uh, there's some very accomplished casters um, in the United States right now. And, you know, there's there's some of them that are, you know, my build, you know, the five you know upper five lower six foot figures you know and 
you know, just medium builds that are, you know, I think uh, Will Nash is the, the current U.S. champion. And, you know, he's he's uh, about two, three years older than I am. He's actually from Avon. Oh, that's so, awesome. Uh, man. That's awesome. Are you getting about yeah. the same distance out of your fly rods, too? <laughs> yeah, totally, dude. <laughs> that's um, a- I'm, I'm, you know, honestly, I, I spent, before I even put a, put a, before I ever went fishing, I spent a year in the front yard getting my cast down because I knew and where I live that if I couldn't, you know, if I couldn't put some line out there, I wouldn't be able to, to, to play the game. So, you know, I'm, I'm actually, you know, for fly caster, I'm not a, I'm not great, but I'm, I'm decent. Now, if know, some, I get the job done. That's awesome. If yeah. somebody comes by your shop, I, I know we got a guy watching, I think his name is By. Uh, Byron, I believe I'm saying that right. Uh, Shaw, he said that you taught him a lot about casting. Oh yeah, Byron. Yeah, Byron. I think yeah, I missed he, his name up earlier, but yeah, Byron. Yeah, Byron Shaw. Yeah, he actually played. Uh, he actually was the uh, the lead guitar player in the band I played in for a long time. So uh, he worked for me for a while. He's a he's a great buddy of mine. But um, but yeah, he's actually living in Sebastian, Florida, right now. Okay. Oh and, yeah. So um, he asked that question earlier. Then that's what he was asking you. Yeah. Yep, yep. So, um, but yeah, man, uh, he he uh, he fished with us in a couple of tournaments. Man, he's a he's a, he's a great guy, man, and uh, we uh, we had some good times. <laughs> That's awesome, man. So, That's if somebody cool. comes to your shop, do you? I, sorry, I keep asking so many questions. I'm just kind of curious. Do you like? Will you take them out there and give them a lesson? Do you charge for lessons, either casting or? I do. I, you know, if somebody just wants a little demonstration or something like that, we'll uh, you know I'll certainly uh, certainly oblige them. But if somebody wants to come in and actually learn how to do it yes i do do lessons and yes i do charge for them awesome. um it's typically uh, i charge 50 bucks for an hour lesson if somebody wants to come down and you know learn something about casting or you know if somebody wants me to take them across the street um show them some surf fish and stuff things like that i'm you know i'm certainly uh, certainly avail- available for that and you know don't mind doing it but you know hey uh, if nothing else stop in the shop say hi you know if you got any questions we're more than happy to accommodate you in the shop we got a great staff of uh, good fishermen, fisherwomen. Um, my wife Becky works with us. Um, you know, so we've we've got a great staff here. And if you need anything, just stop in, give us a call, and uh, we'll certainly help you out the best we can. Awesome, man. Well, you guys are good people, and I enjoyed you know my time when I got to work with you. And now, I'm especially enjoying you being on the show. I'm definitely gonna have to get back on the show and talk about some in depth fly fishing or targeting you know fish or something or fishing in mexico we'll find out something crazy to get you For back sure. on the show yeah, um, i'd love to come back anytime you guys want to have me uh just let me know yeah, awesome, you've got man. me jones in to get up there and do some surf fishing <laughs> man anytime you guys want to come up man have a we do a live podcast on the beach there we yeah, go i awesome. like it i like it well yeah so if you guys are first we can we can wind up on the sound side drinking beer and listening to gangster rap. You know? <laughs> it, it, it could happen by everything all at once. You know. Hey, you where know? are my keys, Billy? I'm on the way. But yeah, we're we're gonna just cut this off. We'll be up there in a few minutes <laughs> or a few hours. All right, guys. So if you are in the Outer Banks uh, for Fourth of July weekend, stop by Hatter's Jack Man and go see Ryan and his team up there. Um, I I guess that's it, man. What a great show, dude! What an awesome it, show. It so much information. Out, so many technical issues, but we're gonna work them out. I pr- I'm like a tech nerd. So I can't. I'm like uh, Billy is so. It's he's gonna ready bother to me. Out. It's gonna bother me forever. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, all right, guys. We'll have a great uh, week. And we got um just before we go, we got a special guest next week. It's gonna be Richard Andrews of Tarpam Guide Service. Uh, man, just tell us a little bit about him, Jess. I know that's your a good friend of yours. And yeah, Richard. He's Richard. a great. Before. Oh, you fish with him too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. 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 Yeah, Richard's super cool, man. He. Fishes a lot of the coastal rivers of North Carolina. Really fishy guy. Um, super nice. Loves sharing information. He is kind of like the North Carolina striper wizard as far as the coastal rivers go. So uh, we're excited to jump over and talk to him about striper fishing. We're going to talk to him about you know, kind of everything that he does. And um, hopefully he'll be somebody we can bring on a couple times too because he's got a bunch of different areas he fishes, a bunch of different um, fish he, he targets in different areas. And so he's got a lot of good information. But, yeah, come awesome. check us out. And one thing I want to say is Cliff Nagel uh, – shoot us your address and we'll get that in the mail so just go ahead and shoot it over to our facebook messenger and and, and we'll get that that out in the mail to you excellent and that's episode four here of eastern current uh, with ryan white talking about surf fishing in north carolina appreciate it ryan thank thanks, you thanks guys a good for one, tuning man. in thanks guys. you guys have a great night thanks for everybody turning in
Tune it in, turn it on, everything. Yep. Have a good night. <laughs> Tune it in, turn it on, and turn it off. See you later, man. Peace. <laughs> See you. Bye, guys.